Welcome, listeners, to the Grand Booth, the Big Feast, with myself, Cole Smithy, and this week's special guest host, Mr. Bernard Feinsod, director, screenwriter, editor, man, man of all trades relating to film. Welcome, Bernard. Thanks, Cole. Uh, you're you're too kind. <laughs> So you chose uh, Guillermo del Toro's award-winning Shape of Water. Absolutely, yeah. Incredible film um, set in 1960s Baltimore against the Civil War, a uh, Cold War backdrop, uh-huh. and um, touches on you know Latin America, inter-American relations, and Latin America and uh, colonialism, and you know sort of the rape of the Amazon and the oil industries. And, um, biomedical research in Baltimore, though they shot it in Toronto. Uh-huh. Um, well, we're we're, we're going to dive into it. I lo- I, and you're from Baltimore, right? Absolutely, yeah. Okay, so great. So there's going to be so much. It's going to be fun to hear your perspective on this great movie. But I did want to talk about the beer that I chose for oh, us to drink. 100%. Uh, which, it, it, it caught my eye for a number of reasons. A, it's from Stone. B, it's a double IPA. And then the name is Fear Movie Lions. Fear period, movie period, Lions, double IPA. And, of course, there is a, a creature on uh, their icon is a creature. Oh, what a great monster beer. Yeah, <laughs> so I thought, I thought that this would be an appropriate beer for us <laughs> to, uh, to imbibe. So cheers, cheers to the Stone Fear Movie Lions, double IPA. Let's have a little taste of this drink. Oh wow, it's the unfiltered, uh, the unfiltered double. Those are nicer. They, they got that nice grain to them. Yeah, it's got a little sweetness to it. I like it. It's yeah. yummy. It's got it's a uh, it's got a nice balance. All right, so let, let, let's get into this movie, which I, I don't know if you if you would classify it a fantasy or a magical realism film. I think it veers toward fantasy a little more than magical realism but it's certainly full of of social import and uh beautifully shot beautifully edited i we both just watched it again recently i i I, just last night and the what, what really struck me about seeing it the second time is how just meticulously edited beautifully edited the, the movie is it moves so seamlessly oh man the perspective is incredible i mean right down to like some of the the later transitions and stuff uh there's this scene where sally hawkins is on the bus looking at the raindrops as the wind blows them oh i love that i love that scene and it sort of like uses this watery wipe to her feet walking through the lab uh that she cleans for a living yeah um yeah he uses but, water in, a, a, as a beautiful image system in, in the film and I, I felt like he he pushes toward overdoing it with the the teals and the greens uh, it, oh the color motif yeah, is, he, is he super re- blue and green he and really goes for it yeah. but I but but that said I I enjoy it it's beautiful it's really lush and you can just it's a it's a feast for the eyes but, but right down to the jello that he's he's asked to change the jello from red to green <laughs> in the ad. And Michael Shannon's yeah. character eats the little green candy, hard candies. Yeah, I wonder if that's almost a joke about <laughs> about the color <laughs> motif that's built into the movie. <laughs> um, it's it is it is kind of a fantasy. It's like a fairy tale. It's a love story. It's like a classic uh, love story, like a with like a almost like a Casablanca sort of like unbridled love. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, it, it, it extends across multiple genres. It has the old Cold War horror, sort of monster horror sure. uh, yeah. and, history and, and behind he, it. And he very clearly is is using Creature from the Black, Black Lagoon as a touchstone. A hundred percent, yeah. And when he's, he's Guillermo del Toro has spoken a lot about that, yeah. as that as a primary influence. Yeah. But he flips a lot of the tropes that are commonly used in those sorts of uh, like unrequited love story, fantasy horror movies, uh, he, he flips them on their head, uh, which I, I really enjoyed because mm-hmm. you you wind up seeing the same entities represented differently. Yeah, and it sort of is kind of a, a direct in your face to the sort of like propagandist nature of a lot of those films at their inception in the fifties and sixties mm-hmm. and seventies even. 
um, and sort of like it takes it takes what what was formerly used to build fear in society mm-hmm. and flips it on its head so that it's there to actually break down those forms of xenophobia and intolerance and othering um, where like your antagonists are the ones who are othering who, yeah. as opposed to your protagonists who are more all accepting. I think it's interesting how he, he, he really uses these six main characters and there are these dualities within the relationships. So there's this, similarity of the relationship between uh what what's the is his name giles giles is a uh, is is the the closeted gay roommate right. played by robert jenkins he's, yeah is it or richard jenkins richard jenkins richard, yeah, richard yeah, jenkins yeah. The great, great richard jenkins and so you've got this uh this duality going on between his, uh giles relationship to the the creature and you've got this uh, dual thing going on between Zelda and El- Eliza. Yeah. And so you've got the, these these dueling characters, and then you've also got the power structure between the Russian guys and their scientists, and between the American military and Michael Shannon, their point guy. Yeah, the the Russian the the, the sort of like american cia influenced military versus the soviet spy um ab- absolutely the parallels are real and all of them are bridges mm-hmm. for eliza to these like other aspects of the world because she's sort of isolated as a mute right um so giles and zelda or delilah mm-hmm. as uh <laughs> michael shannon's character calls her um they're sort of like her bridge to the speaking world in a lot of ways and they're all outsiders a hundred percent. A black woman in Baltimore in the sixties, yeah. in uh, during the civil rights movement, um, and the closeted gay man in Baltimore, who's in love with like the the straight pie guy. Yeah, uh, at the diner. Yeah, and 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 the, the creature. And at the, yeah, exactly. And the creature, the monster, is is obviously alone, which yeah. is a loneliness is an incredible theme right. throughout the film. And even the the, the agents of state are lonely and isolated because both of them come to understand that at the drop of a hat, they don't actually have the support of the state for which they work. They're on their own. And, and at the, the earliest signs of trouble, they'll be abandoned and even, you know, stricken down by their own, by their own systems that they're there to, to prop up. They're just pawns. And yeah. that, that's one of the most fascinating things about it because it draws an amazing parallel between superpowers and the way they operate and um you know country overall also yeah. means that if you're if you're not doing your job to prop up the country like you're worthless you're to d- them yeah you're and, disposable and then that makes you know they're they're just as disposable as as the the subjugated peoples of the film who are the main characters the monster Eliza Zelda Giles are are all painfully aware that there's something in society preventing them from being fully a part of it. Yeah. And, um, and that, that's sort of each of them has that struggle. Uh, and the, you know, specifically for Zelda and Giles, they have the realization at a certain point that it would be less human to not support, um, Eliza in her sort of like mission of love to then, than it would be to, you know, to stand back would be less human than to, to than to help her, and um, and that plays into like w- buying into corporate expectations. Giles is an ad sales artist. He's a painter for do, doing mock ups to sell Jello, and he's like also an outsider in that respect because he was. And fi- who, who, fired who's the famous alcohol. artist that did all the Americana stuff? He, it's in that vein, you know. Oh, talking, yeah. You know. What I, I'm talking I, about. Oh man, I, yeah. I don't know the name you're talking about, but I, I re- it's a it's a. In, it's an absolutely unmistakable look that gets replicated for you know people's billiards rooms. Super, <laughs> yeah. super nostalgic, super Americana, super white. Exactly, the, f- the nuclear family. Uh, w- what does the guy say? He's, he tells he tells Giles, make him smile bigger. Yeah, he's like they're already <laughs> super happy, man. <laughs> like I can't make these people any happier. Make them happier. Uh huh. Um, make the, make the Jello greener. Uh huh. Yeah, 
I, th- I think that I think that the 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 agents of state in the same way have their realizations like a little spoiler, but it's late enough for these. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, oh yeah. But Michael Shannon's character kind of only comes to terms upon death. Whereas like the Dimitri or, or, or uh, Dr. Hofstadler. Um, Who's that actor? Oh, what's his name? He's, um, he's done, he's done a lot of Coen brother stuff. Yeah. He's, he's terrific. Great. He's so great. Um, he, he, he kind of, comes to the realization earlier because he's asked by the lab to kill and crack open the creature and the russians want him to kill and dispose of it before american the americans can do the research he's sort of like a vital carrot like a vital representation of like in too deep and this isn't right he has he has a crisis of faith in everything that he stands for yeah Um, and that really occurs for him in a major way whereas michael shannon's crisis of faith is a kind of a crisis of faith in himself. Like he just wants like, when do I get to stop proving that I'm decent or good? And it's like, dude, you haven't proved that. Right. Exactly. You're, <laughs> like, you're, you're, you're neither of those things. And we learned that very clearly in his, uh, flirtations with Eliza, where he, he really tries to come on to her. And, uh, Oh, that scene is grotesque. It's yeah. so ugly. It's a very ugly scene. Yeah. His, his, his fantasy is a demure, woman who doesn't speak who is completely subordinate right um and and that sort of like toxic masculine narcissism plays out for him as his like primary drive for the entire film it's the way he approaches his work it's the way he approaches urinating yeah he wants <laughs> he, he 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 wants to he wants to inflict pain and humiliate and yeah. and he's got that outrageous electric baton what is that thing it's a cattle prod. It's a cattle prod. Yeah, he calls it an Alabama howdy do or something oh. like, something like that. And it's it's a representation of of um of like southern racism and Jim Crow. Right. And like crowd management during the civil rights era protests. Right. So um and it it, it sort of it touches on that uh, a little bit in another scene where Richard Jenkins tells um, Sally Hawkins to flip to channel because she's watching civil rights protests on TV. Right. She's watching the news returns. Yeah. He says, change the channel. Right. And he would rather watch, like, Bojangles. Right. Which is, like, a complete flip. It's like, no, like, go back to the minstrel era. And that's Richard Jenkins, like, his his drive as a, as a, as a, as a man is yeah. conflicted where, like, he wants to be braver. He wants to be able to be himself. But he still exists in this society where he also recognizes as a, himself as a white man, as someone who's capable of like blending in and fitting into that culture. Right. And and, as, and at the and, and, and at the same time, he also has a tremendous amount of respect for the skill that it takes for that dancer to do those those moves. Yeah, yeah. And, but he he well, he compares him to the white dancer. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Um, but that's and that's also Shirley Temple. Yeah. Uh, right. That, that's yeah. So that that was like uh, there is there's something very, you know, it's the it's the it is still the like it's the black guy that's teaching her how to dance. The cultural aspects of the film, a lot of the culture is drawn from subjugated communities or subjugated people, um, like, and and that that plays out musically a, a bit as well. I think um, Alexander. De- Desplat is, is that uh, who he did the uh, yeah Alexander uh, Desplat yeah. Desplat he did the the score right and it's incredible yeah it has it has a number of influences in in film history and also just like or, or sym- symphonically or orchestral orchestrally sure um, but it it kind of like you you can see the uh, the influence of black culture in the selections. Uh, for who is watching which television show mm-hmm. or at which given time. Yeah. Um, there's like the whitewashed uh, beat era show on Michael Shannon's family television on Strickland's TV that his kids are watching or that he's watching. And right. In, in his, in his perfect American dream home. Yeah. Yeah. Which is like one of fifties, early sixties era dream home. It's completely sanitized. Yeah. And picket fence, uh, breakfast table, that conversation that they have over the breakfast table is hilarious. The like, kids asking about the future, which is another huge theme 
like futurism and posthumanism in this film. Yeah, oh. you yeah, when the when the car salesman tells him that, you know, you're a man of the future. Yeah, he buys it right away. And there's all and also the 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 poster that uh Giles is working on uh the the title of the of that poster is something about, you know, the future is near. The food of the future or something like that. Yeah. 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 And 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 then there's um there's the kid asking his uh, asking Strickland about the jetpacks. He said, "Are we going to oh, have right. jetpacks?" And he's like, "Of course. This yeah. is America." Right. <laughs> right. Um, which is like it's it's pretty perfectly Mc, like a McFly moment almost. <laughs> but um he 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 really buys into that America is the only future sort of like outlook. Yeah. Um which is also a cold war outlook cuz that they're they're the reason they've kidnapped the 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 creature from the Amazon in what I guess might be Ecuador, um, based on the mentions of like oil drilling, because the CIA had operations and like basically propped up Chevron in the Amazonian rainforest. Oh yeah, Ecuador oh yeah. Around that time, yeah. Um, he he kind of uh, he kind of allu- like is is alluding to the fact that like America is the only future. Like it's a very it's centrist mentality. It's sort of like the Cold War era, era space race. Like we're going to beat these guys, and that's why they're doing the research. Yeah. Because of the dual breathing mechanism that the monster has, they're trying to figure out how to put men in space as opposed to the a dog. And they're using the biblical references, the way that white people of that era love to do, where and and still love to do. Where you know it still happens, I, I, you know the White House correspondent will quote, you know that you know it's it's in the Bible, or you know and make a quote from the Bible, and so we get this these Delilah associations from. I mean, we were seeing parallels to that right now playing out with immigration in the United States. Like Jeff Sessions pops up at the podium, yeah. references the Bible, takes things out of context to suit his own meaning. Um, but really like is propping up his own bigotry and xenophobia by misusing stories. Uh, that's it. and, and that's, that's the rhetoric of like a manifest destiny United States. And it just goes on and on and on. When will, when will it ever end? That's amazing. It, it, it's, it's a little stupefying that it's, it, that it still goes on, uh, especially considering that I think that the, the number of atheists, the percentage of the population that are atheists is, is, is somewhere, I don't know, like over 50%. I did want to, like, the, we're looking at uh, the sketches of the monster, and I did want to say, because I interviewed uh, Guillermo del Toro, del Toro for Pan's Labyrinth and Can, and he's quite an artist, and he designed the monster. So, you know, those sketches that, that were that are in the movie, that's that's his sketch. Those are his charcoal yeah. sketches? Yeah. Oh, amazing. Yeah. I didn't even know that. I know he's an uh, he's an illustrator. Yeah. But I didn't realize that he had done the uh the monster the sketches design. himself, the yeah. one, the ones that um that are in the scientists are in uh uh, uh Hostetler's notebook. Yeah. Oh, wow. I mean, it's it's really impressive that this movie stays true to the 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 B movies of the fifties in that they were all uh, pretty much low budget films. And I can't remember how much he made this for. I think it was, it was less than $15 million that he made this movie for. Yeah. Yeah. And less than 15, less than 20, I think yeah, actually. And that's a low, that's a low budget movie. So this really is a, a classic. You, you could call it a classic sci-fi B movie, except that it's, it's made to very high standard. It's 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 interesting that there was a great year for that sort of uh, B movie turned A movie, uh-huh. uh, like Get Out. I think was the same year, uh-huh. which is also sort of like a horror B movie turned into a primary. This is a film now. This right. is a commentary on why B movies were. Yeah. What, what what type of devices they had to offer? I don't I don't think Get Out is, is stacks up anywhere near the stature of this film. Though, I have to say. Uh, the in terms of. Um, the effects that they accomplished, and, with and, the and also, budget. and it's also, amazing. and also, the story. I feel like, like the, the Get Out storyline, it has some, some, some pretty big weaknesses in it. But this thing, I feel like you could hammer nails in all day long. It's really solid. This story yeah. is very solid. It covers such a broad spectrum. It's, it's, it's really incredible how many issues they were able to touch on. Uh, Del Toro sort of infused it with something for everybody. Yeah, it's in the fabric of the story. You nothing's beating you on the head, 
but it's all there. And you get even from uh, Zelda's character, mm. when she she talks about, she, she has a line about short men, how they'll always stab you in the back. <laughs> yeah. And so, you, you know, you, you get people's prejudices, too. Yeah. And even the, the relationship between her husband, mm. where her husband won't stand up for her uh, when the chips come down. Yeah, he with, sort of snitches. Yeah, totally. He absolutely snitches. He does, yeah. yeah. And she really comes down on him but you know so we get all of these character uh flaws even in the people who you know ostensibly would be uh, i don't know what the word is but um you know they, they would they would typically be be kept pure in 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 a lesser filmmaker's hands they would right. they, they would be more stereotyped but Del Toro allows everyone their flaws. Mm. I think that's I think that's absolutely true. He 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 really uh, he even allows for the most flawed characters to be folks you feel bad for, like at various points, which is in a similar way an amazing strength of this film. Where like you know that that moment where uh, where the general the five star general is bawling out Michael Shannon for losing the monster. It's such a and great scene. It's an amazing speech. It really is. He's so hardcore. He tells him he's going to be in a world of shit in an alternate universe, like as a civilian. Yeah, he, sa- he says you're gonna you're gonna what is it? you're gonna be lost to to civilization or yeah. lost to being a civilian essentially, which is like the worst thing that could happen is that you would be just another schmo. Yeah, and that's bullshit first of all of but, course yeah, of course but, it is but that's the military ideal and that you know exactly. it, and and that's what i was thinking about earlier when we were talking about how uh the, the military always eats its own but because people are uh such natural followers uh you know there's that lou reed song where he says you know you, you uh, the first thing that comes along that allows you the right to be, you follow it. You know, yeah. you know it's called bad luck, and uh, <laughs> and I just think that that's you know that's it, it's so ingrained and and now I, I think in this country more than ever this uh, knee jerk tendency towards conformity. When I was growing up, I was born in '63, and so. I caught the last few months of the Kennedy administration. Well, that's like the, I think this is set in basically 1963, 64. Is that, is yeah. that right? Okay. So it's right at the end of the Kennedy administration. Uh, oh, the Cuban okay. Missile Crisis is cited in the film, so it had oh, okay. to happen after 62. Oh, interesting. Because um, because the 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 general mentions the Cuban Missile Crisis when he's talking about the oh, space race. Oh, right. I forgot about that. Um, so. It, it, it's actually maybe maybe set the year you were born <laughs> and and so I you know I remember the the hippies and all the civil rights struggles that were going on and coming out of Watergate in the 70s and there was this real sense that everyone was everyone was hip and in, in, in the cool in a cool way and everybody knew you know to be you know, to fight the system, mm. but that was the, that was the thing that was like, like everybody who was cool and there were like, everyone was cool. And so, you know, the, the going, um, you know, thinking on the street was, was, it was, it was correct. It was it, I'm not saying that it was politically correct. I'm saying just the opposite. Uh, and then yeah, you have it, these, these it, urban centers that where that was like a melting pot for, and I'm sure it was that way. You know, I, I, I grew up in Richmond, Virginia, and I'm sure it was that way in Baltimore. You know, that that was the sensibility on the street. And but now all of that has changed into this whole other thing. Uh, I don't even know what it is. But you, you look at movies like Lady Bird, which I had to see twice before I, I realized what a toxic movie about conformity that that film is. Uh, it struck me as such when I heard that there was a Dave Matthews song featured prominently in it, but Bingo. I actually didn't Bingo. see Lady Bird because I was like yeah. kind of worried about. You hit that. the nail on the head there. I self censored myself from seeing that one. Yeah, you you did the right thing. No, I mean she's she's a bad person. She's she's a racist and a homophobe. And her goal, even though she colors her hair pink or whatever color it is, that's not who she is. That's not what she what she's after. Mm. She's totally in the race to the bottom. She wants to just fit in. She wants to be the ultimate conformist. And I feel like that's where people's heads are at these days in this country. That's a that's a huge part of it. And I think that like um, 
regardless of which side you're picking that you want to fit in with, there's a lot of people who are just trying to fit in, regardless of whether you're on the right or the left or you're moderate or there's some sort of thing to latch on to that's like a, whether it's a centrist movement or a leftist movement. And it's, you know, there's, there's, there's also the right side of history. So, I mean, I would rather latch onto that. Exactly. <laughs> sure. But people manipulate that, you know, you have yeah. all sides talking about what the right side of history is. Exactly. And, and, and that means something different to everybody. Yeah. And, and, and reinventing history constantly. Mm -hmm. And you see that in textbooks and, you know, what's taught in schools. Oh, man. You know, I wonder what the same history textbooks that I would have been fed would be now if they're different or the same, you know, what, what, what rewriting of history has occurred just in the last uh, 13 or 14 years. Since Every, I was everything is an indoctrination. And, mm. and what I really love about film, and one of the things that keeps me going as a film critic and that really started me off was I have this book by John Coble. It's the top hundred movies. And he surveyed 80 different filmmakers and critics and got their top 10 movies and distilled down, down from that list yeah. the top 100 movies. And so when I got out of college, I started going to the public library and taking them all out and watching them all. And what I qu quickly came to realize, you know, when you're watching uh, The Great Dictator up against Andre, you know, uh, what's the uh, the Russian film? I can't remember the name of it. But anyway, the point is you see this humanitarian thread that runs through everything, and this movie fits right into that category. Mm -hmm. Where, And I think that's the beauty of, of, of global cinema is that it it carries this thread of, of humanitarian values that's very strong. And I would see a movie like Lady Bird flies in the face of that. It's not of that ilk. And so it's, you know, it's if, fascinating. If you know, you know, if you if you know what you're looking at, you can easily reject that film. Mm. And when you look at a lot of the superhero films, I, I think that those movies too fly in the face of that because they're just about spectacle. And yeah, I think and, it's and they're spectacle. and they're and they're promoting violence because mm -hmm. that's that's what they're feeding off of and that's what they're promoting is military violence. Yeah, they, they the the there's countless I mean, it's a, it's, it is like a secret, secret service sort of thing. As, as soon as the superheroes start getting indoctrinated into government service, there's like actually that Civil War, like I think it's, what was that Marvel movie, Civil War, about Captain America and Iron Man's like internal war amongst themselves about whether or not they should be there to serve country or humanity. And I think that's actually, oddly enough, a common theme in more sophisticated films, and they deal with it better but a lot of what the comic books do is boil down those sorts of themes to being more black and white than they actually are. Um, but I mean, like even in the even in those, you have like civil war theme. I mean, then the superheroes live for so you're a superhero for like 50 years before you die somehow. So you've got Captain America is like this 80 year old dude, but he's 25. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like um, and in, in in Shape of Water, there's an element of that where the conformism is what the minority characters are fighting against. So Eliza knows she doesn't fit in and she, she feels like the, the monster is the only one to see her for who she is without seeing what's missing. Whereas any other person would look at her and be like, well, she doesn't talk. Right, and that's what's missing. One thing that I that I that I noticed th this time around that I don't know, I don't know if I if I really caught the first time was the Audrey Hepburn reference. How uh, uh, what's his name Giles? How Giles? He, he, he you know he's got the TV guide with Audrey Hepburn on the cover. Oh yeah, and then he's got the he's he's doing a portrait of Audrey Hepburn, and that's just for him. Yeah, and it's pretty clear that he makes that association between. Audrey Hepburn and Eliza. A hundred percent. And yeah. that's really cool because Eliza, she might be a little homely, but she has that same femininity. She has that same romantic spirit. Oh, she's absolutely, and she's absolutely, absolutely beautiful. And that's, I think, a big, a big part of why they cast Sally Hawkins. Sally Hawkins is so great. She's so terrific. Yeah, and and I think I heard the. Del Toro talked about that in his in his in his press junket, like interviews, and uh -huh. I think he said essentially, like, I'm going to be poorly paraphrasing, but yeah. 
um, he said basically like he selected her because he needed a beautiful woman who was not someone who you would want to obtain, Mm -hmm. but someone who you couldn't help but fall in love with. Mm. And that's a very different type of beauty Mm -hmm. where, and, and, and then it plays out in terms of the narrative. She's an object to Strickland, Michael Shannon's character, right? but she's a natural beauty to the representation of the organic divinity, which is the monster. There you go. And that's like, the there is there's a heavy environmentalist bent to this movie for sure it's like an undertone definitely where you're sort of like dealing with uh advancement of sciences for human gain in the face of what's best for nature and it kind of hint at it yeah a lot over and over again but it's not it's not in your face you know but but it's very clear that they just want to kill the creature and that tells you everything you want to know. Like th- their only interest is in killing the thing. Yeah, it, from a, from only forty five minutes into the film or something, you know that they're out to kill this thing. Have you seen Happy Go Lucky? Do you know that film? I haven't seen it. No, it's I know the really film, yeah. great. And that's the first th- thing that I ever saw Sally Hawkins in. She's so terrific in that movie. I can't remember if it's a Ken Loach movie. Maybe I can't remember the British director who who made it, but it's re- but that's how that's how I discovered her, and I just think it's great that that I'm gonna Del, have to Del Toro add that one to my list. Yeah, yeah, put that one on your list. Yeah, that Del Toro used her uh, because she she has uh, such a magnetic quality about her. Oh man, it, the the to touch back on the issues of conformism. Yeah, that's like the um, the Giles character who he's. It's his recognition of his own loneliness when he goes to try to repitch his new green jello painting. Right. And comes back to Sally Field, which is actually the scene on <laughs> on screen right now. Uh-huh. Um he he uh he he essentially says to her, I'm alone, you're the only one I have. Yeah. And in that moment, he strips himself of his corporate affiliations. Right. And I think, like, the late capitalism themes are prevalent in sort of the transformation of all of the supporting cast members who are kind of on her side. Yeah. Um, and and Zelda does the same thing, where she's kind of, like, suddenly realizes that she says she's a bad liar. She almost threatens to, 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 to out um, uh, Eliza for... Kid- kidnapping or freeing the monster and in her moment in in the interrogation when she says like no she said thank you when when sally hawkins is signing excuse me it's okay when sally hawkins is signing fuck you at michael shannon yeah she covers up for her and in that moment you're like oh she's she's stripping herself of her corporate affiliations and picking a side and the corporate affiliations represent a masculine white world yeah, for everybody. Yeah. So each of these characters is struggling against the same it's machine. A, it's it's a pretty outrageous thing that Eliza does when she signs "fuck you" to Michael Shannon because, regardless of whether he knows sign language or not, it's all on her face. Yeah. And it's pretty ballsy, you know. She's really just she doesn't give a flying fuck. She's just gonna. She's like she's blank gonna, though. It's not yeah. like an aggressive. No, it's not aggressive. Until like the fourth time she does it. But it's but, but it's very centered. It's she's completely very defiant. centered. Yeah, yeah, very defiant. It's, that's an amazing. That's an amazing moment, and it's her opportunity to to sort of to sort of like let him have it for the way he treats everybody. You know? Well, like, and on, it's also an, an interesting, uh, subtle commentary on the power of silence, because even though she can't speak that makes her more likely to take action Mm. and so rather than than somebody who would would talk about their ideas or their plans or their schemes or anything she's put in a position where for her there's no there's none of that she she absolutely she's gonna she's gonna take action she's she's an operative at that point and and he as another operative recognizes his loss of power in that moment because something is happening that he's incapable of understanding. And that's, that's also a theme throughout the movie is just knowledge. And the, the monster is a representation of the furthering of knowledge to what ends is really the question for Sally Hawkins or Giles or Zelda or Dimitri, the, you know they're coming to terms with their desire to know more about 
life or some greater truth well, while the knowledge the you know the government agents are after is you know it, it only pertains to the cold war it's right. space race right uh and and even the the russian general equivalent he he tells dimitri like look kill this thing we don't we don't want to we don't we don't care about learning we care about our enemies not learning right, <laughs> like right. that's that's right. more important and right. that that's an example of what plays out these cycles of repeated government infraction on human living. Well, there's a great micro microcosmic metaphor at play with Michael Shannon's fingers that the <laughs> the, the rotting <laughs> that fingers. the uh, the the creature, i.e., nature, has bitten off two of his fingers, and they try and reattach them. And throughout the film, they're turning black. <laughs> And eventually, he has to rip them off himself. And I think that's just a very not-so-subtle microcosmic metaphor for Mother Nature and how science and people, you know, the military, who are going to take advantage of it, it's, it's, it's going to rot. Mm -hmm. And it's all, you know, and, and it's going it's to fall off. And nature is, is, is its own cure. You know, like our organic divinity god monster yeah is running around healing people left and right he brings sally hawkins back to life except for the, the, poor, the, the, poor, the poor cat but there, has, there, has, the cat, there yeah. has to be a casualty there were like five other cats <laughs> that's be, right, yeah. Yeah. they got enough cats yeah, he had more than one that's that's a good point he did have, he did have more than yeah he had a few that's the make it up to Peta. um <laughs> <laughs> but uh but you know like he he brings the the monster gives giles his hair back yeah when he heals his arm Right. There's there's multiple iterations. He self heals when he gets shot to death. Yeah. Um, and I love what he does. What get, what Del Toro does with the, that iridescent blue on the monster's skin. It's like a bioluminescent. Um, it's so beautiful. Yeah. When I when I was in college at Evergreen in the in Olympia, Washington, uh -huh. we had a beach, and there would be like bioluminescent bacteria at night. And wow. If you ran your hand through the water, you could see like the bioluminescence shining. But like that's. That's a m miracle of marine biology yeah. and nature that, yeah. like, that is nothing but pure splendor. Absolutely. And if you've ever seen it in person, it's it's what they built into the creature, which yeah. like is, it's just mesmerizing. It's uh, that was an advanced piece of creating a character that's not human. I mean, the, the Blue Lagoon monster is. Laughably lo-fi. Black, black, black. Lagoon. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, Blue, Blue Lagoon. Lagoon. That's that's, that's the one with the, <laughs> yeah, yeah. the teen sex yeah, movie. Yeah, the uh, the the monster from um, the creature from the Black Lagoon. Yeah, is uh, <laughs> it's not Brooke Shields. No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, is is a uh, he. It's it's laughably lo-fi old B horror sort of stuff. Yep. And this is like, but again, I mean, there, there's the love story in, in Creature from the Black Lagoon. A hundred percent. In yeah. a King Kong sort of way, yeah, or absolutely. Like a, you know, yeah. Um, and and like the scene where the monster swims under, uh, was it Julie Andrews? Uh, the the this monster though has like a super high fi. I love how I like, love how the eyes blink from side to side. Oh yeah, in like a very reptilian sort of way. Yeah, very reptilian. Yeah, and and the 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 like. Um, just the general, it's sort of like a slit. It's like a sports car version, you know. He's got like For the six sure. pack. He's got oh, yeah. the muscles, you know. Like it's it's kind of like you're looking at like he's this very tall alpha creature of its own, absolutely of its own kind, which you don't know. It seems like it's one of a kind, but you don't totally know. They kind of hint that maybe this is like the last one or the only one. And Michael Shannon does have that realization at the very end that that. That the creature really is a god. Yeah, when he cuts his throat, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I mean, he right. shoots it like five times. Yeah. And he just gets up. Yeah, yeah. That, that's I mean that's a that's a powerful moment of realization where even you kind of feel for Michael Shannon even though you hate him. Yeah, because you're like, well, you're you're not going to win this one, and yeah. you're 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 either going to die doing this, or when you fail, the government is going to ruin the rest of your life, which you are like this general is going to strip you of your title you're not going to be a colonel anymore you're not going to have a future in the military you're going to have to get a job as a milkman you're going to lose your family probably you know you're going to get divorced it's going to be all sorts of hell to pay yeah it was it was pretty pr pronounced 
So you, you kind of like, you're like, oh, you're, you're just a helpless pawn too. You kind of feel for him from a, like a more meta perspective. Right. But at the same time, it's like, man, you didn't have to play into the system. This was your choice. Well, and see, and now we're back to that thing that I was talking about earlier where, you know, and then, of course, you know, punk rock came along and, you know, songs like, you know, Career Opportunity, the ones <laughs> that never knock. I mean, you know, how could you how, how could you live through the, the punk era as I did and, and come away giving any th- thought? to signing on for any kind of service or service or yeah. any of that caca that's uh, it's stuff i never considered in my life exactly and, and it's uh it's it's largely based on just the knowledge that really when you sign that dotted line you're signing your life away you're also signing something that says that no matter what you believe in you're just going to do what you're told and to me that's the antithesis of freedom and it was one of my early lessons in in the the fallacy of the Democratic Party because it was Jimmy Carter who reinstated the draft mm. when I was at that age, and I I just oh man I, I would have done there's no way I would have left the country I would not have gone into any kind of military service I, under any circumstances these aren't these aren't my wars you know mm-hmm. <laughs> like it, it it's disappointing you know and to now, watch of cycles play out. And, and, you know, now we've moved into this, as everything seems to do, we've moved into, into all corporatized ideology just feeds into endless war. And we've been at war for as long as any millennial can remember. I mean, for me, I was in, in 2001, after 9-11, I think I was in Italy or the year after, whenever shock and awe was was, was two thousand eight, two thousand nine. So I was abroad visiting my brother. It wasn't even that late. It was like two thousand, two thousand three. Yeah, two thousand. Yeah, shock and awe was earlier. Yeah, it was like two thousand three. I think I was I was visiting my brother in Italy and watching the bombings happen live on television, and you could see like the missile flares and everything, and. um and I realized, like, you know, that was going to be the foreseeable future at that time. And I was growing my first beard. <laughs> I was, like, 14 <laughs> years old, 13 or 14 years old or something. I was growing my first beard, and, and my brother and his friends and I all struck a deal that none of us would shave until the war was over. Wow. And I, none of us have upheld that deal, obviously, because if we had upheld it, yeah. I would have a beard down to my knees and I'd yeah. still be growing it right oh. now. But it, it's endless, you know? Yeah. Like, and that's that's the endless war that is predicted in so many sci-fi dystopian novels and things like that. And it's it's present, endless war is present in Shape of Water. The, the Cold War is resurfaced now. <laughs> yeah. So this, this thing that was already quote-unquote over is playing out now globally in a whole new way there are proxy wars in Africa, in the Middle East, all over the world. Everywhere. And it, it it's actually just, it, I mean, it makes you wonder, is, uh, these times of prosperity and peace are just sort of like also a construct. Well, it's ca- <laughs> it's cash through chaos. Mm. You, you break it and then you hire the contractors to come in to fix it, knowing that they never will. It's yeah. just a way of creating more demand you just want to create constantly be creating more demand if you can destroy enough you're forced to create in response to that yeah but 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 with no pretense that you're that you're really fixing anything hmm that's very true there there there's a pretense or there's there's a pretext that you're probably not going to fix anything well that's Um, yeah and so it's so it's a given so when the, the 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 companies that you're paying billions of dollars to aren't able to follow through on whatever the contract said they would Mm. do. Oh, well they got paid. Yeah. What are you going to do now? Just more counterinsurgencies and things like that. Um, Well, that's, uh, that's interesting because one of the, one of the aspects of this film that, that I think is like an underwritten underwriting current. And also it's really upfront. Um, but it's the the cultural exchange between different parties from different backgrounds as opposed to, you know, like 
forcing the monster to conform to the human world, there's this sort of like invitation from Sally Hawkins. And that's, that's like, I'm going to teach you the language I speak. I'm going to, we're going to, you know, I'm, I'm going to, we're going to listen to some albums together. We're going to, you know, uh, you're going to discover the wonder of the cinema in that, in that beautiful Elgin movie theater in Toronto, which is based on the Senator in Baltimore. Um, and which is like a beautiful historic theater that's been saved multiple times yeah. by the city from yeah. becoming whatever, like a target. So, so did you want to uh, talk about the, the military industrial complex around Baltimore? A little bit. That would be great actually. Um, cause I, I was listening to some other, some other podcasts or other, you know, I read it, was reading around and I, I was listening to the slate podcast or some others. And it seemed like maybe there's this notion that, there's no military industrial complex in Baltimore or there's no government facilities, but there's a, there's kind of a, a pretty striking and well-documented history of biomedical research facilities in the greater Baltimore area, uh, just outside Baltimore, about 30 minutes North or a little bit further is Aberdeen proving grounds, um, which is a well-known like biomedical research facility where the, especially during the Cold War era, a lot of chemical warfare and weaponization of disease type research was being done. And in Frederick, Maryland, about 45 minutes to an hour out as well, is Fort Diedrich, which is known for the same. So it was a hotbed for that type of research. They would set it in the country just outside the city so that if anything went wrong, it was sort of, they could pretend it didn't happen. It's sort of off to the side um in the film i think for convenience the the research facility is more set in the city kind of in the city by the sea sort of uh sense like in the opening voiceovers or like there's a you know it's a it's a city where there's nothing else <laughs> uh just the coast mm -hmm. and the thing about it is is that, <laughs> that that's a that's a lie and it's an open lie that i think Del Toro wants it to be a lie. It was like, mm -hmm. this is actually a cultured city mm -hmm. with problems mm -hmm. and it's trying to work itself out. Mm -hmm. And the people who live in the city speak for themselves. You have art and film enthusiasts, hardworking people who are struggling for rights. Um, and you also have like this sort of vapid false culture of the future of corporate America. And it's being sold right down the pipeline by everybody who you learn to hate throughout the course of the film. Mm -hmm. There's this pie salesman who's from Ottawa. He talks with a Southern accent and pr pretends to be a Southern American. Baltimore is just below the Mason Dixon line. So it, it's the South, but they've, the, you know, it was in the union during the civil war. So it's sort of this conflicting thing there that actually like exists in the film. You know, that, that guy's, he's a homie sort of like, uh, southern host but at the same time it's all a front and i think that that speaks to sort of the the front of southern hospitality i was just gonna say it's because i'm from richmond which was the, as everyone knows was the capital of the confederacy yeah and yeah that whole uh kill him with kindness thing it's believe me it's all about the killing not the kindness yeah the minute somebody's out of the room uh -huh. the next comment comes out of the mouth and it's not all sweet toothed and <laughs> no 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 it's it's yeah. really i i just find it repre a reprehensible trait of of the south and it's pervasive I don't, yeah. it's still pervasive i think this and i think the south is awesome like i think there's a lot of beautiful cultural you know heritages in the south of america like not just dishing the South, right? Sure. But I am, I am convinced that you know the two-facedness of our society is represented very clearly in the adoption of the false accent in this film. Absolutely, you know, like, that's 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 like, and that's um, another really meaningful scene. It's not overplayed. Everything that that Del Toro. It's such a beautifully written movie because there's just so much economy throughout nothing is overstated nothing is overplayed the suspense there there's layers of suspense that build but even that's not overplayed 100 you know, percent. because yeah. it's the it's a it's a romance story it's a love story mm -hmm. and so that's that's the theme that's the overriding theme 
Yeah, it's it's about the love and the lack of love. Yeah. And a lot of the love story is so bold because of how much plays out where characters want love, yeah. but it's not there for them. Yeah, I, and, and Octavia Spencer's character, Zelda, is in a, a pretty loveless marriage, mm-hmm. and it, that act of betrayal that the husband commits... You think his name is Bruce, but it's really Brewster. Brewster, yeah. As you find out. <laughs> yeah, Brewster, yeah. But Brewster is not a man of integrity. No, he's not really. He's kind of just a hardworking, lazy guy who does his job and comes home and wants to be taken care of by his subordinate. And doesn't wife. say anything. So in a way, he's he's a he's a mirror of Michael Shannon's character. Yes, he's a black mirror of Michael Shannon's character. Michael Shannon, who who thinks of himself as being a decent human being, but isn't. Mm-hmm. And this guy who. Presumably because he's married to this clear, clearly a, a woman of, of of morals, you know. So you would presume that that he would ha- share those, but no, it doesn't. And in the similar, you were you were talking about the parallel characters too. Yeah. Yeah. In in the similar sense, Zelda and Giles are are um, deeply linked, and there's a couple moments where they really like drive that home. And one is one is the moment where Brewster is not much of a husband to Zelda and he's ready to turn her in. Yeah. And another is the moment where Giles sees, as he's getting kicked out of the pie shop, sees the same false accented Ottoan kick out the black couple in right. a really mean way. Yeah. And the two, in that moment he realizes that he's not, he doesn't want to be that. And yeah. all of the Bojangles watching and all of his right. sort of like so internal conflict of like what keeps him closeted. He kind of in that moment is like, Oh yeah. And he speaks, um, he speaks up. Yeah. He speaks up and then he, he wipes his, he takes the napkin yeah. and, and go like puts it in his mouth and scrapes the pie off of his, his tongue, tongue instead yeah. of just like spitting it out. He's like, uh, it's yeah, like he wants to get he, all of it off of him. Yeah. It's it's like it, that moment is the moment he purges himself right. of all of the falsehood that yeah. he's bought into yeah. that has kept him from being himself. And there's so I mean, that's such a great scene, and, and and you really, it's not overstated, but you really, you get it, you understand exactly what that means, exactly what that action is accomplishing, mm-hmm. and, and and there's just so many layers to this movie that 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 really add up. Everything adds up. Oh, it's incredible. And that's you know, I know that there's you know some audiences have an aversion to to fantasy or, or magical realism, but what I think about that is when it's in a social context, which is you know like the Milagro Beanfield, whatever. That's another um, that's Robert Redford's you know magical realism. Yeah, very uh, leftist ideology behind that. This is actually a very leftist film too, and as much as leftist is is a dirty word. Uh, it remains a dirty word, and and there's really I don't think there's a single news outlet in the country that truly represents any leftist ideals at all. I think that anything anytime the meter starts to go a little bit left, it's just it's killed off. But what I think is that you realize that if you know about the history of bossa nova music, for example, that in Brazil bossa nova was a re- was a leftist movement. It mm. came out of this this ideology that was uh, inspired by the Beats. And uh, so it was this it was this really focused leftist ideology. And that's in this movie, too. And that's really cool to me. I really like that. They really they really did did a good job of of representing just uh, any aspect of a modern society that is disenfranchised and like right down to the monster itself, which represents like whether it's earth, religion any sort of divinity, uh, otherness, otherness, immigrant, I- immigration. It's a, and it's a kidnapped. It, it's, it's been kidnapped. It came, it came, it comes to the United States involuntarily, which is really important because most people who are leaving their country to come here aren't leaving because they want to come here first and foremost. A lot of the time it's because they want to leave where they are. Absolutely. And that's important to distinguish. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that like, like in this in this film there's a there's a whole lot of you know pushing forward of people who are trying to get out of their lives or to recreate their lives if they could um even you know Dimitri Michael Shannon Dimitri's trying to be extracted he wants out he's done he's no longer he's I I get my safe house 
I got to go live the rest of my life. I've done my service. And they're like, no, you're just going to die. Um, and it speaks to, it speaks to how hard it is to break free of the structures that confine us. Um, I, I think like the, the, the monsters sort of vision of post-human life is one where people don't know the traits that define humanity. They're, they're trying to establish throughout the film that what are the traits that define humanity? Is it the ability to communicate? Is it the ability to be emotional? Um, is it the ability to understand language or, you know, uh, to, to identify with culture like music or, uh, or movies? Um, and I, I think that like what, what it winds up being discovered is that it's an ethic and it's how you deal with othering or, or, or the other that defines humanity. So the, 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 the theme there is, is sort of, uh, which is central to who is quote unquote, a good guy or a bad guy in this film, uh, by the end of the story is that, you know, it's less human to dehumanize than to humanize. And that's well put. It's not a, um, it's not necessarily the, uh, the, the monster that is the monster. Oh, right. The, oh, of course. The monster is a, is a, is a society that is unmoving and right. un, unmoved yeah. by the miraculous. Mm-hmm. And, and that speaks to also why I think fantasy is like a powerful genre. I, I would put this film in a sort of a genreless car- category almost. Uh-huh. It's got elements of all of that sci-fi, fantasy, yeah. horror. It's a love story. It's it's it's, it's a, really like a Romeo, Juliet, Beauty and the Beast, like yep, all that stuff. It, it doesn't. Uh, I think that's why it rose to the surface and sort of beat the pack, and, and one best picture is because it didn't. If it could have been put in a box more easily, and didn't have so many as so many pieces for so many for so many things in society that are interconnected, but also isolated unto themselves, whether it's war, you know, uh, what, what is human racism, homophobia, gender issues, uh, science versus nature, or how can science support nature and prop it up versus how is nature used as a resource for science and science only is for human beings. It's not exploited, exploitive. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So like, those those sorts of themes really prop the movie up for me as a film that recognizes where our society is now by pointing to the 60s <laughs> like it's, yeah. it's 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 essentially says we've gone nowhere we have have we even the general character says have have we learned nothing like he's right <laughs> it's not a question though we haven't learned anything yeah it's totally rhetorical yeah yeah no you're right i love it i love it well, I want to thank you so much, Bernard, for coming on La Grande Bouffe. Oh, thanks so much for having me. I'm sorry to chew your ear off, but <laughs> no. I, listen, we, we you know we, we have we have listeners in in Munich and Ottawa and Turkey and the Arab Emirates, all over the place in France. So, you know, that every, I think that probably they like to have their ears chewed a little bit. I appreciate <laughs> I appreciate it a lot. Um, uh, just a quick a quick note, if if. If any listeners want to continue to hear from me, or I, I'm on Twitter. Um, I have an, uh, Twitter. It's at Bernard Feinsod, and uh, an Instagram. It's at Bernard. It's a jumbled up version of my name. That's at B E A R N R D. Spell it one more time. B E A R N R D. There you go. Yeah, just jumble up Bernard a few times. You'll find it. Okay. All right. <laughs> And, uh, of course, I always want to encourage our listeners to please help support Le Grand Bouffe, the Big Feast, through Patreon. Just 5 or $10 a month can really help us keep the podcast going and make you part of the community. There's rewards on Patreon that bring you uh, to the table that we share these great craft beers and, and films. And, of course, I want to encourage everyone to turn your cell phones off as much as possible, but certainly while you're walking, driving, riding a bicycle, or watching a movie. La Grande Bouffe, The Big Feast is a production of Smart New Media.